Welcome to the Workplace Wellbeing Essential Series. I'm Mari Ryan. I'm the CEO and founder of Advancing Wellness. It is my pleasure to welcome you today to this expert interview where we explore topics that impact employee well-being. My guest today is Victoria Doxett. Victoria is a thought leadership consultant and an executive ghostwriter, and she helps her clients increase their authority, impact, and income with strategic thought leadership campaigns. She's also a fully qualified philosophy lecturer and enjoys applying philosophical approach to business communications. She's a contributing author on the recently published book, Winning the War for Talent in the 2020s, and of which I'm also a contributing author. Victoria, welcome. I'm so excited to have you here today. Oh, well, thank you for having me. It's great to catch up with you. And I'm looking forward to our chat today. Always fun to be together. Yeah, always. So let's explore some elements around this idea of talent management and values. In the opening of your chapter in in our new book, uh, Mm -hmm. you state, what better way is there to attract talent than to identify those values that you want to see in your employees and to exude those employees in yourself? So I'm curious from your perspective, why is it important for an organization not only to have values, but to live those values? I think that's a really good question. And I think it's, I mean, I I like applying a kind of philosophical approach to business communications, as you've said. Um, And I think when we look at businesses, I think it's quite easy to stop seeing them as kind of... um, organizations which have a heart and a soul and sometimes Mm. especially the big corporates you kind of see them as a as a business rather than as an individual I guess so I like to think about business values in the same way that I think about individual values and I think it's about having consistency and congruence Mm. um, about having the values that you you want to see in your employers or employees sorry and having those values yourself. So trying to be the best that you can be, and then that way you will attract people who want to help you grow Mm -hmm. and want to be part of that journey for you. So how does having and living these values help employers compete in today's war for talent? I think people are becoming more discerning. And I think Mm -hmm. people are not stupid. You know, you can fool some of the people some of the time, but you can't fool all of the people all of the time. And I think especially with social media, there is no hiding place now. Mm -hmm. I think if you are not showing who you are and being consistent in the way that you show who you are and doing things in a way that is appropriate, I think people are not going to want to work with you. And because people are being more selective and more discerning, they want to work somewhere that's going to help them to grow and help to fulfill Mm. them, not just financially anymore, but also morally. You know, there's a kind of moral compulsion, I think, to businesses to attract people and help people grow and become better. Um, And I think that's what will attract the war for talent in the 2020s and beyond. I think it's having an ethical framework, having a sustainable framework, and seeing people as individuals who you are responsible for in a way, rather than seeing people as workers who will help you get a bigger profit. Right. Well, this is so interesting because, you know, one of the things that I talk about a lot in terms of how we create cultures of well-being in the workplace, you know, we know that millennials and well, everyone really wants to have meaningful work. And they, you know, it's not just about the compensation. We want meaningful work, but they also want to feel that connection to something that's bigger, to that purpose that that organization fulfills. And to me, values really work in service of the purpose that that organization fulfills. And profit's not the purpose, profit's an outcome. Just curious about your thoughts. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And I think with the pandemic, we've seen a real shift in working environments haven't we and the way that people work and I think now that you can work kind of anywhere from the from around the world you don't have to necessarily physically go in the office um you you have to if you're a business you have to be much stronger in who you are and much more um conscious of your own personality I guess as a business in order to attract those people to work with you um, and I think, you know, communication is a part of that. I think you have to have much clearer communication now than you did before because mm-hmm. you are communicating with people 
in in different places and across you know different uh, continents often too. Mm -hmm. So you do a lot of work with leaders on communication related topics. I'm curious what role do you see communications playing in an organization and how it influences those values? Gosh, it's, it's massive, isn't it? In fact, the, the reason why I first kind of fell into communications really, because as you said in your introduction, I'm a philosophy lecturer, so I'm a teacher, um, first and foremost, and I've been doing that for 15 years. So I only really fell into communications four or five years ago. Um, and that was as a direct result of being on the receiving end of very, very poor poor communications. Mm. Um, I was working in an environment at the college. Uh, we were going through restructures and redundancies and nothing was being conveyed mm. um, in a meaningful way. There were no values at all being shared by employers and the the, the business that we ended up working for. Um, there was no kind of philosophy that bonded us together. Mm. Um, and it got to the point where, you know, emails were being sent and then recalled. So some people had some information, other people had other information. And there was a real lack of cohesion. Um, and it was it was it was awful. It was awful because you didn't know. Uh, whether you're being made redundant or not you didn't know if mm. your colleagues were being made redundant so that really was the catalyst for me to get more involved in communications with the college mm -hmm. I ended up doing a lot of work in the union um, and then through that I kind of started working with businesses because I think I, I know in the thriving hive you talk about the importance of communication in a thriving hive and it's absolutely right. integral I think if you have open honest and clear communication even if that communication is not always going to be well received Mm -hmm. You still have a duty of care to, towards the people that you are employing, to be honest with them. You know, it's not easy to tell people that they are at risk of redundancy or that there's, you know, financial issues on the horizon or whatever. But you are responsible for these people who are giving you their hours and their days mm -hmm. and their time, you know. So communication is really, really important. And failure of communication, um, it can be catastrophic on so many different levels. Right. You know, I, I am, you and I are so um, aligned on so much of our thinking in this way. And I've really seen, especially during this time of the pandemic, where there are so many unknowns and things are changing so quickly. You know, we have this, you know, what people keep calling the new normal. And I prefer to refer to it as the normal for now. You know, yeah. is we only know, you know, as much as we know today, and this could change tomorrow. And we see literal changes from week to week going on where we think we know what path we're on and then we're not on that path anymore because something else has changed. Absolutely. And I think employers really, um, I've seen some good examples of employers who really have worked hard at communications. One of my clients, you know, when the pandemic started, they began a daily email to employees to be able to tell them, here's what we know now, here's how we're responding, here's the situation, so that they could at least share that information and reassure people that this is what's happening. Because as, yeah. as you well know, in the absence of that kind of communication, people are going to make up their own stories. Absolutely, absolutely. And I think sometimes communication that says, do you know what we don't know, but we're working on it, it's fine. That, that to me right. is good communication. You know, it's much better than radio silence. It's much better to hold your hands up and say, do you know what? We're all in this together. Nobody knows right. what the future is going to hold, but you know, we're working on it. You know, we are thinking about it at least, you know, we're working on it rather than radio silence, which people always interpret negatively. Right. You know, if you don't hear anything, you think it's bad right. news. That's human nature. Yeah, exactly. In, in um, so in the book, you describe um, the an excellent business, and I'm curious to to hear your thoughts on what does it mean in in this changing world that we're living in. What does it really mean to be an excellent business? Yeah, it's another good question. So in the book, I kind of try and kind of I, I look at it from a kind of philosophical angle which is kind of my background really so I was looking at excellence in relation to the ancient Greek culture and they have um virtue as being very high up um at, at, you know as a, as a good um measure of excellence they would say that being virtuous and I guess we would say now that would mean kind of bravery and honesty and being truthful um I think to be honest it's not that much different now for businesses you know I think you can still attain excellence and I think for today business is really it's about sustainability I think that excellence that virtue that bravery that truthfulness 
comes down to being sustainable and it's not just about planting trees or doing good things for the environment although that is a part of it I think it's about making sure that everything you touch goes on to be better as a result Mm. and that's not easy to do but truly excellent businesses I think are, are aspiring to do that so they're not just doing what they can for their employees they're also trying to do what they can for their community. They're mm. also giving back to charities um, or, you know, giving giving back to the world in some way, whether that's planting trees or supporting, you know, refugees or whatever. Um, and also, I think that the products that they or the services that they provide should also be sustainable in some way. You know, they shouldn't be long term damage into the environment. You should be looking at better ways to do things to make people's lives better or easier. Um, And so many businesses are doing that. I work with entrepreneurs and purpose driven entrepreneurs and they are incredible. You know, there is so much good that business is doing. And I think really governments, you know, they leave a lot to be desired, don't they? And I think businesses are kind of stepping into that gap and really doing a lot of good. Um, And I think for me, that's what excellence is in business now. I think it's about leaving a legacy and making sure that you give more than you receive. Well, it certainly contributes not only to the well-being of the people who are there in the organization who can align with the purpose, um, but it also it supports the well-being of the community and the world at a, at a bigger level. So Absolutely. it's all around well-being for, for all parties. Yeah. And it's a win-win for everyone, isn't it? Because the, you know, the, if the business is successful, then you get more profit and you can then increase your revenue and, and help more people. So Yeah, I think and I think most forward thinking businesses know that. And I think most forward thinking Mm. businesses are are trying to do something that is sustainable in that way, which is a really good thing. It's an exciting time to be working in business. You know, there's a lot of very exciting initiatives that are happening. Um, And, you know, technology is is a massive help in that respect. I think, you know, there's there's stuff now that we can do, um, you know, just in terms of supporting agriculture, for example, in developing countries. Mm. Um, that we couldn't have done 10, 20 years ago. So there's lots that businesses can do. Um, and I think it's an exciting time. You know, I love working with my clients and seeing uh, the innovations that they're coming up with because it, it's inspiring, you know, it's, it's really inspirational. That's really fun. It is exciting. Very exciting mm. times. Challenging in some ways, but very exciting times. Absolutely. So you also mention in the book that there's mounting pressure for businesses to look after the health and well-being of their employees. Mm-hmm. So of course that caught my attention and yet they are still playing that many are still playing catch up. Mm -hmm. So what do you think it will take for employers to see well-being as being the individual employee well-being as being both urgent and necessary? Yeah, another great question. I think, I think to be fair, they're already seeing that it's necessary. I think the pandemic has given rise to lots of talk about mental health which is a really Mm. good thing really positive thing lots of talk about equality in the workplace because it tends to be um the women that are doing the homeschooling whereas the men don't tend to be i know that's a a sweeping generalization but there has been a lot of um uh you know a lot of noise around you know the, the the way that work is divided in the house especially during lockdown and the pandemic and stuff i think sometimes it became more extreme Um, So there's been a lot of dialogue um, about this, which is a really good thing. And I think employers now know that it is necessary to look after your your staff, you know, to look after your employees and to make sure that they are as well supported as they can be. I think the urgency is missing. (laughs) I think uh, Mm -hmm. it's not being tackled as urgently as it should be. Um, but I think it's kind of like pushing, it's like pushing a, a you know, snowball up a mountain, isn't it? You kind of, it takes a little while to get the momentum going, um, but then it will pick up and it will pick up and it will pick up and mm. then it will kind of roll under its own steam, I think. We kind of saw that with um, with the Black Lives, Lives Matter uh, movement. We saw a huge amount of equality and diversity um, conversations, which is is really good. I mean, it's 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 about time, isn't it? You know, it's it's late. It should have been done a long time ago. Um, and I think we're seeing the same thing now for uh, employee well being. Um, so yeah, so the I think the necessary. I think it's seen as necessary. I, I don't think it's seen as urgent. So that's something that perhaps we need to work on. Well, I'm on that mission, and glad to have you, you on are. that mission with me. So thank you for for making those contributions. 
If our audience wants to learn more about you, Victoria, and the work that you're doing, where can they find you? Um, so the best place probably is LinkedIn. I'm most active on LinkedIn and you can just search for me under my name, Victoria Doxat. Um, you've mentioned the book that we both contributed to. That's on Amazon. So um, your audience are very welcome to go and uh, have a look at that on Amazon. Um, and you can also find me on my website at www.victoriadoxat.com. Um, but LinkedIn is probably uh, where I'm most active. So please do connect with me on there and I uh, look forward to having a conversation. All right. Thank you so much for being here today. As always, it's just a delight to spend time with you. Thank you for having me on, Murray. It's been great. Thank you. Thanks.